I did a signal tutorial in Train's Tane SB3 back in August 2018. Now it's time to update and improve that tutorial for the new TRS 2019 version. This one will include a lot of extra information and you can even download a copy of the test route for your own use. So let's get into it. Today, in presenting this signals tutorial, I'm not just reworking the Tane SP3 version I did in August 2018, but I'm changing the approach with more examples, some ideas how to manage the signal portfolio, and best of all, making available actual signal test route to download. You can then learn at your pace, using the route as however you want. I have tried to ensure there is no payware and all dependencies should be available on any basic TRS-29 simulator content library. One caveat, I note the default procedural track I've used is listed as payware. This is a mistake. But it is included in every version of TRS-2019 anyway, and Tony Hilliam from N3V has stated they will change that from payware to a more appropriate status shortly. I'll start with some basic principles. There are a number of different types of signals. Most of them have the same basic scripts. However, some of the more advanced versions do have extra features. For example, some have signals with number plates on the posts, some don't. What this means is, I don't recommend mixing signal types on one route. If you go to use search-like signals, as I have on this route, or perhaps jointed rails G-style signals, as I use on the Pennsylvania and Ohio route, or maybe even the Pennsylvania Railroad circular signals, they do not necessarily have exactly the same scripts, almost guaranteeing that you will have strange effects and errors and faults, so don't do it. I use an Excel-type spreadsheet to record my numbers. This is mainly so I don't waste time finding the next available number. You can even use WordPad if you prefer. You should devise a system for doing your numbering and use it on every signal in the specific route you're working on. And if you work with modules like I do, make sure the same numbering system is on all the modules that will join into a single route, ensuring every signal number is unique across all the modules. The example I use in my Pennsylvania and Ohio route, which was developed with modules, works as follows. It is made up of three individual fields. The first one is a three-digit area code. For example, if you have an area called New York, your code might be NYK. If you have random names, some starting with the same first few characters, you need to carefully set these up before you start, so you don't have any ill-conceived codes. In the Pennsylvania and Ohio route, I have one advantage. Most regions, destinations and locations have the first letter as unique. That alone gives me 26 names in a route. However, in addition, all my names starting with the letter A in my assembled route are sequential along the track of the main line. This helps with my switch list, as well as finding a specific location, because Ashfield City, the first location, is located in the most eastern position, because the Pennsylvania and Ohio is designated as an east-west railroad. So theoretically, if I had a town or location called the Zackfield, as in Z, it would be the furthest west. I hope that's clear. Field 2 is a direction code, north, south, east and west. If there's a single line main line or a two track main line, this will designate which side of the track the signal is on, again making it simpler to find. And field 3 is a numeric code. I use the range of 0 to 99 as my number range, as I think it's unlikely I would ever have more than 99 signals in one location. I've not had an example where this number range is too small yet. So an example code in my Pennsylvania and Ohio would be ASH for Asheville, then E or W being east or west, then a sequentially allocated number, say 21. I hope that makes it clear. Anyway, the point of this little dissertation is to encourage you to define a name slash numbering method for your signals and make it what you're comfortable with. But try to make it as simple as possible, and definitely should be one of your own design. Incidentally, I even considered doing the same sort of thing with junctions, but decided there was just too much work. And besides, if I find a problem that I want to locate later, I can use the nearest signal number, or the generator junction code that TRS2019 gives anyway, even if it is a problem with the switch point. I should mention I have used the most basic default switch lever, 
in switches on this case, only because that way I can be sure when you download the root, the switch lever I use should be there. Most types of signals do have some signal plates. These are plates that are attached to the post of the signal and will display the number if you allocate it. However, there are two problems. First, not every signal in any particular signal type will have plates. And secondly, the system that I've adopted on the Pennsylvania and Ohio is way too long for any plates that exist in the G-style signals. So don't rely on plates to identify your signals. Download this file without a password or code. I've chosen this method initially because it does take a little while to get it approved and uploaded on the DLS. But I will be starting that process shortly too. OK, let's get into our first tutorial. OK, here we have a single locomotive and a single boxcar, and I purposely made the block size between signals relatively short. We're not here to just watch trains move along, but to watch how signals operate. And I'm using a basic controller because once again, driving a train is not the relevant issue. I want to show you how signals operate. So let's get this train moving and see what the signals do in each situation. If you look at the bottom of the left screen, You'll notice there is a line indicating a start and stop points of where this locomotive will be moving to. And you might notice the first three signals have a display that is not red, and all the rest are red. That's because in TRS-19, as was the case in previous versions, the signals only display ahead four blocks. So watch as this locomotive passes through the first signal, then moves to red. And you'll notice the first red signal, after those showing a non-red aspect, will now display a non-red aspect. And because I've used short blocks, you should easily be able to see the aspects on the following two or three signals and watch how they react as the train progresses. I'm not going to spend time discussing what each aspect means because you need to research the aspect display for the particular signal type you select to use. And they can be totally different on some signal types. Be warned. Now the aspect here is fairly common, green over red, and indicates the route selected is straight ahead. If it was red over green, it would probably be taking the left diversion, and that's all I can say about aspects, for now anyway. Note, this signal has red over green, so we should be taking the left diversion. I certainly hope so. Now we have a yellow colour. This is a cautionary warning. And in this case, we're essentially entering an underground area or dark territory, which means no signal. However, in trains, if there were no signal at all from here on in, this signal would be at red permanently. So to avoid this, again because this is trains, at the end of the line I've placed a haze bumper, which acts as a type of placid signal, which in essence has no aspect and no real meaning, apart from being set to a default stop signal, which is why we have the yellow caution, and which is what should happen. You'll notice now in the bottom left, in the signal list we are heading straight for a red signal, which is what it should be also. So now, how do we get this train back where we started? With the signals displaying the correct aspects. So what we need to do is, the engine will drop off our load, that is our single boxcar, and go around the passing loop to get back in front of the train.
Now that we've attached ourselves to our box car once again, the engine is facing the wrong way. And if you look back to the first signal, immediately in front of the engine, it's still red. So there's a little trick we have to apply to make trains think the engine is facing the right way. Then hopefully the signal should work. So just above the controller is a number of signals. One of these is a circle with two arrows. And when we hit that, a green arrow will appear on the back of the train, indicating the back of the train is now the front of the train. Confusing, isn't it? However, you will note, once the engine starts moving, the signals will wake up and the train is ready to go back home. And there you go, we finished this test. Okay, in this test we can do the same run from the original position as in test 1, but instead of going up the siding to the left, we can go up onto the dual track mainline area. This clip will be speeded up to about 300%, so there will be a bit less commentary time. At this point you'll notice we have a green over red, whereas in the first test it was red over green, indicating we were going to travel on the left diversion. Now it's straight ahead. You'll notice on the next signal we have green over red again, which means straight ahead. The setting of the signal however can define either leg as a straight ahead leg. Let's see which it is. Now we are on the double track main line and we are on the correct line and direction and running hard. If you are in Europe, UK or Australia that probably means the up line. Now we've reached the end of the line and we need to get back home again. To do this we need to cross over the main line we just came along and over the crossover to the other main line. If this is not signalled correctly, head on collisions can occur. So let's hope I've got this right. Well, I might have the signalling right, but it doesn't seem the way I want to go legally has been set up correctly. So I'll have to check the switch settings.
Did you notice as soon as I got on the correct main line that it automatically extended the track diagram in the lower left by adding all the extra signal aspects? And that can be one of the hardest things to achieve in crossing from left main line to right main line. And yes, I'm not sure I'm using the right technology for the USA, but then I don't live there. So now we're back on the single line working, which means more of the same as you've already seen. So I'll stop here and we'll move on. Hopefully, I've now given you some new insight into signals in TRS 2019. I'm also giving you access to the route itself that I've used for this video. So go ahead and download it using the link in the description below. It comes from Google Drive. It's now up to you to use this route for your own education. There are still several route direction choices that I haven't yet shown you. Load up your favourite engine and run boxcar or passenger car and go exploring. There is a three-way track wire joining three tracks, which I haven't shown you. And this is signalled to work correctly. However, if you want to set your route up for multiplay, you'll need to add one extra sophistication, which is the interlocking tower facility. I've not covered that in this video. It is destined for a tutorial of its own, for another time. I've also included two signals that are not quite right, deliberately. But there is a working version of the same signal in the same situation elsewhere on the route. So see if you can find them and fix them. And please, if you find any improvements you'd like made, or any problems that you can't fix, by all means let me know in the comments below, and I'll do my best to help. My next video will be another update on the Pennsylvania and Ohio route that I'm building. In that new episode, I'll be finishing off most of the final details of the Fullerton Interchange Yard, which was a fairly complex job by itself, but an even bigger job was adding in another module, called the North Fork Turn Branch, which has a considerable amount of trackage, including two very large coal mines with three or four track yards for each sipple, and the mining town of North Fork is included, with 15 miles of branch trackage added from the Fullerton Interchange Yard up to the North Fork Township. There is a gravel industry site on the way to North Fork too. And then onwards the first of the two tipples. In total these two tipples can generate over 100 cars a day of loaded coal hoppers. After passing these two tipples there's another 5 miles of branch line with up to 3% grades to reach the next tipple and there's more to come later. The branch was originally developed in Tain SP3 and I've had to laboriously convert it up to TRS 2019 by replacing all the old technology trees with new ones, adding lots of tough X grass to most of the right of way, upgrading the new technology on the signals to TRS 2019 and there's heaps of other minor details added. And I've added 15 miles of branch line trackage what is the largest branch on this first version of the Pennsylvania and Ohio Railroad. So I've included selected images that have been popping up while I spoke to whet your appetite for that next video. It will be well worth a visit. I hope to see you then. If you'd like to be one of the first to see that next video and you're not a subscriber, you better subscribe so you get notification when it's uploaded in the next week or so. I hope you found this tutorial enjoyable and of benefit. If you have any thoughts to share, please add a comment below the video. I always check the comments and appreciate every one of them. But now, that's it from me. Hooroo!